Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Glacé Film Club podcast. Yes, here we are once again to get a film, grab it by the scruff of its neck, tear it apart, <laughs> and then see what we think about it. And when I say we, of course, I'm not on my own here, just having a good old rant. I'm joined by my good friend, the man who's got views for days on films. Of course he has, and we all want to hear them. It is Callum. How are you doing, Callum? Very well. I've got, I've got coffee. Yes. We're live again. We're live. We're live. It's great yeah. to be in person speaking to you. It just th- there's a yeah. certain joy in doing it, isn't it? And it feels special for us, and I hope it feels special for the listeners as well. It's you know a bit more fluidity. Mm. You know, you can. I don't know what I was going to say then. <laughs> I was going to say something profound. Oh god, it would have been so profound. Well, s- save the profoundness for the review. I'm sure you'll have plenty of profound things to say. But you, we do get to share a coffee as well, which is always a good experience, isn't it? It's nice. Yeah, yeah we have people who like going around prancing around cities with coffees in hand. I did bring you a prep this morning. A prep. It coffee. was very nice yeah. to see you as I walked up to uh, to meet you outside here in in the library. The library is where we yeah. are. A little studio in Manchester Library. Two prep coffees clutched in hand. It was, a, it was a joyous sight, and you know, it added to my uplifting spirit knowing that I was going to get to chat about a film with you alongside a pret. The thing that I love about the pret coffee as well is when you order an oat or a sort of a, a milk substitute coffee, they put a big sticker on it. Yes, and it, you, they might as well just you know stamp it millennial. <laughs> there you know, on and the, you on carry the it around with you, you yeah, like yeah. That, strutting about. It's, it's like a, a nice big, feeling. A big millennial ball and chain in the form of a coffee. It's like <laughs> dragging my millennialness around with me. This is why we don't with, own a property with milk substitutes. <laughs> exactly, you know, buying too many milk substitutes. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was a lovely coffee. It was a lovely coffee. But today we're going. Slightly different in our review. We often like to do this. As we mentioned, we go for some new films. Of course we do. Those ones that are being talked about. But we want to throw back to classics. Films from eras gone by with big name actors in. But well-known films. And we're doing that today. But I think often we get different through lines when we do look at these films from times gone by. We've had a great run in the past of looking at golden age cinema of the 40s and 50s. And we took a lot of home truths from those. Today we're going back to the 80s. And I found it fascinating before we actually get into the the review is that we had the Oscars a few months ago now and you look at the films that are, are there being shown now. We've got some big budget epics, but then you've got some talking about uh, issues of the time. But the 80s had a very certain run of styles of film. Yet, and as we'll see with this one, some big kind of violent ones. But I also feel there's a certain weirdness to films in the 80s that they allowed themselves to explore like going down uh this strange almost futurism angle as well and there was like a bit of bit of strangeness with the use of music and in in that but image was a very specific image in the 80s and we know like with for example um american psycho there's a lot of talk about capitalism american dream things like that in the 80s which well, I just wanted to put to you, like, where do you see the state of cinema and films now compared to when we're watching films of that era? I mean, I think, as, re- as, as I suppose reflected in the Oscars to an extent, we're seeing a sort of a, you know, the, the story range is being, has become a lot more broader than it was. I mean, I think, bizarrely, I watched the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary <laughs> recently. Pumping Iron. No, the three-part one that's on Netflix. Oh, you had me excited there um, for pumping iron. I didn't know I wasn't, wasn't pumping iron. Maybe we need to review that one day. But I think, yeah, that would be fun, actually. Um, yeah, we should, absolutely. Yeah, you prepare to hear pumping iron. Um, with cocktails. With cocktails and, you know, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> move, moving swiftly on. Uh, I don't I, I, Watching that three-part documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger being the sort of, like, Hollywood icon that he was in the 80s, there was a particular type of film that was being mass-produced in the 80s. It was overly, you know, hyper-masculine, usually gangsters, usually, um, you know, a conflict or some form of, like, back and forth. And the film served as a conduit to assert a particular type of masculinity. Mm -hmm. You just think of, you know, Sylvester Stallone movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, um, 
the big, even Steve McQueen movies to an extent in the 60s, but like there was a particular, the films were used as a conduit to a, a particular type of masculinity. Whereas actually I think what the Oscars represent is something slightly different. I think Oppenheimer aside, you know, b films like Poor Things, The Holdovers, um, and the nominations as well, like American Fiction um, and The Zone of Interest, that films are sort of asserting a particular, they're challenging that, I think. There's more, more voices coming through. And I say that, I, I'm not saying that, you know, Hollywood is, you know, completely reformed in this because mm -hmm. there's still a lot more voices they can champion. However, I do think something's changed a lot, I think, in terms of what, what might be defined as a classic. Yeah, and there's a, there's a certain run of films from the 80s of like real violence at the heart of them, but reflecting the era and the time of things going on there. Right. But as you say, that hyper-masculinity and um, the in super individualism and yeah. money, money, money era, I think a lot of that is reflected, whereas big themes of the films at the time of violence drugs and money i think politically i think the landscape's changed hasn't it in, in some respects because you know in the 80s you had sort of like reaganomics particularly in the us and you know you had thatcherism in the uk you had you know two sort of big powers pursuing you know relentless neoliberal economic policies and the, and you know you had huge uh social issues the hangover of the 60s and 70s. The 80s, for me, I always think that, like, it was the hangover of, like, you know, crippling economic and political issues from the 60s and 70s spill out, spilt into the 1980s. I'm, I'm always cautious of essentializing certain decades, but, like, I do feel like there was a particular sort of sense of um, spillover there into the 80s. The hang like, the, we start to see a generational change, I think. And, you know, you had, and films sort of reflected that in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, film, it, it was culturally and politically acceptable and encouraged to be a particular type of man. Whereas now, I think that is being broken down massively with art. Well, that slides us into, before we get any further into yeah. that discussion, because I'm sure we'll pick that straight back up in a minute. Do you want to let us know what film that we dived into? What, what classic of the 80s that we watched? And give us a little overview. We went, back, we went back to the 1980s to review... Scarface, um, the Al Pacino classic. Um, I'd never actually seen this before, which for a cinemaphile, I think I was quite ashamed of myself, really, because it's a film that's repeatedly cited in most conversations um, of, you know, when we're talking about sort of classics or the sort of the titans, I use that word very lightly, of Hollywood <laughs> in the 1980s. Um it's repeatedly cited as a classic of a particular genre and of a particular narrative. So we thought, you know, we'd review it. And in the light of, you know, what the types of movies that are coming through at the Oscars, it'd be nice to sort of do a bit of a comparison, I suppose, mm -hmm. to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's about, um, it's got Al Pacino in it, and he is basically framed as a political refugee from Cuba, um, as trying to escape Castro's um, persecution of non-communists, basically. And he comes over to Miami and part of that sort of generation of Cuban exiles in the 1970s and 1980s um, who came over to the U.S. to try and escape as political refugees in search of a green card to try and escape Castro's persecutions, basically. So quite an interesting and one could argue topical given refugee crises that are happening, the political refugee crises that are yeah. happening across Europe at this time. So it's quite, it speaks to the times a little bit, perhaps. But it basically follows his um, sort of life as a political refugee, and then he ends up becoming a drug dealer, drug importer, and this sort of, like, representation of success. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. the film, I suppose, does quite nicely is that it juxtaposes that element of success with white capitalist success, and it plays that off against one another. Yeah. Um, and I think using Cuba as, a, as an example to sort of illustrate that is quite interesting because um, the US had, well, it had basically liberated Cuba from the Spanish Empire in 1889. It had then um, installed pro-American governments in Cuba. So Cuba had always been a satellite state, I suppose, of the US since the, early, since the late 19th century. It then sort of like installed American businesses and American banks. It became 
basically a cash cow for the US until the Cuban Revolution in 59, and then it basically became its own independent state under Castro. So I think it's quite an interesting um, way to illustrate how America used, biz American businessmen exploited Cuban industry and Cuban sugar, and they called themselves successful. But then when Cuban exiles are exploiting American, in American interest in drugs or American sort of loopholes within the legal system, yeah. he's a criminal, when actually America was doing very similar things yes. in the 19th century. So, yeah, it was interesting in that respect. Um, very violent. I can tell where Tarantino got his inspiration from. Um, <laughs> it's very, It felt Tarantino-esque yeah. um, in the sense that it was overly long. Um, <laughs> we'll delve into that later. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it ends in a sort of final sort of, like, um, shootout. It's a famous scene, say hello to my little friends. Um, it becomes a sort of comment on... Corruption, really, mm -hmm. and success, and how those two mesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the thing that does stand out from um, what you said there is it is hyper violent. I felt on edge yeah. watching it all, which is so this is one success of the film is that it builds tension in the right at the beginning. You've got a really violent um, shootout scene, and then it calms for a lot of it, but you feel on edge from that. So from a filmmaking perspective, I think that works really well. That you've got this ridiculous horrific violence at the beginning but then it just simmers it simmers and then builds up to even more horrific violence at the end but that's when we're touching upon what we're saying about films of that era and a lot of epics and mm. classics now we look at from that era are violent often gang mafia films and now we look at our era now i mean it's very hard to say from epics of the modern day because a lot of them are superhero films like yeah, whereas yeah. epics from them you have a lot of these like gangster films and things like that but the thing that struck me is that i do think to an extent this film is a little bit of a critique of american society there is a bit of self-awareness to it especially the scene where he's in the restaurant he's really drunk and then he has a big argument with his wife um he's getting getting restrained by his business partner they all leave and then he's on there like stumbling around and he's in this like real high class restaurant and all the other punters are looking at him and he goes what are you looking at like says that like, you need me it's like you are hide wearers i know who i am i say who i am i think the point there being is that the film's saying that look all these people at the high end of american society they're part of corruption but just in a way that's covered by the law whereas he's doing the same thing as an immigrant but they look down on him and that's the critique of american society and it gets explored that throughout the film of all this like oh, america being involved with corruption and drugs across the world but just like covering it up with different things that's the element of critique and i like that element of it i think that's what it's doing by looking at his character and by the end it's like unbelievably empty the film like he's built himself up he feels nothing and he's there, like, again, in the restaurant, it's a pivotal scene. He's going, is this it? Is this as good as, is this as, good as it gets? That's the on-air sign. Just just gone. Now you can tell we worked in an actual studio. <laughs> um, and, like, he feels nothing from his success. And he said it's all built on emptiness. Like, there's nothing real there. So th there's an element of critique there. But it makes me think, how much does the, is the film a, a self-aware critique or how much does that then balance the romanticism of the violence, the drugs, the money? Because it strikes me that a lot of these films do gather their classic um, tag or status over the years because people enjoy them because it is like, whoa, yeah, like, look at this, like, shoot em up film and all of that. And even though there's a critical element to it, that's overshadowed by that, as you say, Tarantino Esque lust for violence and i think that does overshadow it with this because my interpretation from knowing nothing about the film previously and how i think it's been portrayed to me over the years is that that's why it's great because people love how the violence is portrayed and that whereas actually it is a bit of a critique of that but i think it steers way more into the romanticism of that era and miami and the violence and and the way they dressed and stuff like that so that was the slightly deflating bit of it. And I think a lot of the stuff where we look at films in the 80s, going back to American Psycho, it's absolutely a critique of that society. But 
it's a ultra violent um, film, which in many ways romanticizes that, and people l- like it because of that. It's it comes down to that thing with a lot of pieces of art is like the balance between getting an audience in who actually understand the critique of it or the other part of the audience who are actually there because they like the thing that's being shown and don't understand the critique of it. And I think this steers too far into the romanticism. I just feel a bit empty at the end of it. And then that's the point. Mm. That's mm. the point. But it was just like a bit too much in my face yeah. on that bit. And it's like, oh, like I hated the thought of people liking it because of that. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, no, I agree. Also, I don't know if I... I don't know if my problem is that is with the film necessarily or whether it's people that have routinely said to me, you need to watch this. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's continually it's, you know, chanted at me <laughs> by loads of people just that I know, but also loads of people that I just, you know, generally when we've had film conversations, it's like, oh, you need to watch Scarface. I don't need to watch anything. <laughs> I, I don't need to watch anything you tell me to watch. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> but like I don't know that's it send your recommendations in everyone guys if you get anything that you think that we should watch we're always open to listen that sounded, to that. That sounded so standoffish I didn't mean I didn't mean it in that way um, but like I just I don't know it's, it's continually cited as being an epic or a classic and I just thought I was just a bit let down I was expecting something a little bit more profound I suppose I mean I guess it's that it's part of that triumvirate of movies that I'm very skeptical skeptical of anyway mm. I don't particularly like gangster movies generally speaking apart from Goodfellas and Casino um, they're good films in their own right but like sort of it was like part of the sort of the, the De Niro Scorsese Pacino triumvirate that sort of like you know the uh, Tarantino as well to an extent, but like th- those group, that group of um, sort of directors and artists and actors, all brilliant in their own context and in their own right. But like, I find those movies incredibly um, sort of, there's a lot of hubris at play, there's a lot of arrogance as well. Similar to Nolan movies in the sense that like, you know, everything that's filmed must be committed to screen because I am so, you know, everything that I film is important and necessary for my idea and for my narrative. I mean, actually, half of them just need much better editors. Um, and this is the issue, I think, with lots of these movies, is that like they are overly long and bloated. I felt Scarface was bloated yeah. um, because it was just essentially three hours of conflict. Yeah, It was back and forth between... It was usually Pacino and then another member of a mafia or another member of a drug cartel or another member or another criminal and it was a power play either between other men or a power play between him getting a woman basically because yeah, it very much steers um, into him and his persona and yeah. his performance it's like right. a lot of it is about that and when you think of the general conception of it as again based on me not having watched it before i always think like oh it's about him like the film focuses on him his role the voice he puts on in it well i mean you know his performance is really good i mean yeah. he, he's like a he's like a little viper i mean <laughs> the that's the worst way i f- thought of it when i saw him on screen is like the eyes the piercing glare i think is actually he, he, he's good that's really really good that the, yeah. the glare that he gets is like he sends a shiver. It's a scary. Definitely. Yeah, and definitely. Like, it works. Yeah, it yeah. absolutely works. It does work. But for me, I just found it quite repetitive in the sense that, like, it starts off quite optimistic, I think. I, you know, it talks about the sort of Cuban re- uh, political exiles and they're in a, a refugee camp under a freeway in Miami. Mm-hmm. And there's a sort of, okay, this could be this is going to be quite interesting. But then after that, it's just a lot of expletives you don't talk to me like that. I'm this, I'm that. Oh, don't talk to me like that. Oh, do you? And then it's like, it's just that back and forth and it inevitably ends up in a horrific torture scene or a sh- or a death. Yeah, um, it feels like, are you saying those background elements of it and what I was saying also about it having criticism of the era and the hyper-masculinity, the violence, everything related to that, is that it starts off with a good bedrock of a script from premise yeah. and plot, but it's almost as a right, once we're actually filming this, what can we do over the top to, like, really make it that? And that's the frustration, I'd say, with that style of film from that era, from a perspective, is that there is something in there once you dig. Yeah. And you're like, yes, this is a mirror up to the era. But I think it goes too far towards fetishizing it or romanticizing it rather than it being 
critical. So even though there's that criticality in there of the era, it actually then steers into that. And that's why it becomes this cinematic one that you've got to see because people like it for that, not necessarily what it's saying about the era. I think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think that that has, been, that has come with time, though, in the sense that I imagine when it came out, I don't doubt that drug cartels in the 70s and 80s were that, were that, were, were, were violent like that. Yeah. I don't doubt that for a second. They probably, they absolutely were. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when it came out, I do wonder whether people would have sort of thought it was a fetishization. But, but I also think there's when it, because we've got the benefit of, I suppose, hindsight and seeing all the other movies that came after it mm -hmm. that are filmed in the same vein. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was talking to my brother about this actually yesterday and um, he was saying, that, you know, The Godfather did it and then there's just been so many iterations of that mm -hmm. and i've never seen i've seen godfather i've seen the godfather part two but again it's an, it's another one of those that another movie i'm just like the godfather i don't know it's just like I, it's just a lot of bald white men screaming at me saying you should watch the godfather <laughs> you know what i mean it's just like it's <laughs> yeah what, whatever like yeah. um but like scarface falls into that category mm. for me i mean one thing that i would say actually is i quite liked the way it was filmed i liked the shots the sort of sweeping shots. I mean, that scene when they're in the hotel room and his friend is being cut up with a chainsaw. Yeah. Um, the camera backs out and then sort of sweeps over um, the the main the strip in Miami mm -hmm. um, and the sort of the, the the sort of the blue and the pink neon. It's a quite a nice. It's, it's well shot. Absolutely. You know? When you said um, that, that's the first thing that came to my mind as well. Yeah. Is that and I think again that is a bit more of a stylistic trope of cinema of that time of something that I like yeah. is a little bit more experimental and slightly um I can't think quite the right one, but a little bit of the strangeness to stuff of that era where it allow these more elongated shots a bit more the music being a little bit funkier and things like that is that yeah. that is when you say cinematic or something of that area thing oh yeah when you see films like that I look at them from a modern lens of violent films of the modern era, they don't necessarily push that weird kind of experimentalness. And that was nice from a visual perspective. I think it does get it uh, bob on in that sense. For sure. And that was one thing that I f felt that was quite good about it. I quite liked the sort of the, the synth and the sort of the, the funky mm -hmm. soundtrack juxtaposed with the piercing stare of Pacino and the sort of the way it's filmed. I thought that was the main strength of the film, to be honest. Um, but for me, by the end, I was just kind of like, it, it's fitting that the thing ends in this massive shootout because mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like that's 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 the crescendo, that's the sort of the splurge. Yeah, it's all been building up to this, you know, you know, big moment where people are blown up, um, and it's just a bit. I just, I just, I just felt <sighs> basically <laughs> that I just felt oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that that, that um, size sums up nicely. Yeah, I just I, yeah, and uh, it's but again at the same time it's very of its time and it's I Pacino's performance is good. I just I just can't shake the um, the baggage that comes with it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh -huh. The sort of the the cultural baggage of the sort of you must like this. Mm -hmm. um, and now that's I know that's sort of like a. It's not a non sequitur necessarily, but a non critique in the sense that, like, oh, I don't like it because people are telling me to like it. That's just a rubbish excuse not to like something. Yeah. However, <laughs> I do. There's something <laughs> to be said for that. Exactly, exactly. Um, another thing I would want to say, though, about the film itself is that um, I quite liked the. I, can, I, I quite like. I, it's nice to watch an origin film. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think it was 82 or 83 when it came out. And it you can tell a lot of other film directors or film or people from that era have been inspired by that. Um, and again, it's interesting because I was watching that Arnold documentary and he said when he was sort of coming up in Hollywood, you know, he, oh, big muscular men aren't in right now in the 70s. It's Pacino, it's De Niro, these skinny small guys, yeah, yeah. basically. Um, and he sort of like came into this sort of like redefinition of what masculinity is, you know, um, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe I'm over intellectualizing it. I just, I just thought it was going to be better. Sure. Yeah. I get you that. Know, I get know. that. But there is always a fear of going into something that is hyped so much is that yeah. underwhelm is always going to be a thing. And I think 
<laughs> something else that places it within that view of a classic is that it does have quite a a grand overarching narrative to it. There's a lot of there's a quite a big period of time covered, and I think that's one thing you get in a film of that style is where you, I know you said origin film there, but it, in the sense it's an origin film in terms of the story of of the character like it's where he started out and then he becomes he gets to the top of the the underworld essentially and it follows all of that but that's the one thing that has stood out to me from this type of film i think godfather's a great example is that where i get underwhelmed is and as we often discuss what we like from films are films that really speak to the audience on a certain topic issue theme and give you insight onto something whereas i think a lot of classics aren't that they are big narratives and stories told in a a way that's thrown in different directions but aren't necessarily all about the critique or insight that it's offering we want that mm. we like that it's, that's what we believe films there to do but i i can totally sympathize to people who think films there to give a big immersive experience for a story. And this is a story of that in that genre. And I get it. I get it. And this is like, maybe it's slightly unfair of me at the top of this podcast going in saying, all right, it has this slight element of a critique and holding the mirror up to the era, but it is mainly about, oh yeah, look at this violence and look how it goes on because maybe, maybe it's just a cinematic epic in that proportion is what it's going for. But that doesn't stop from getting in the way that I still think that you can do a cinematic em- epic, but you've still got to be self-aware and, and offer something from the film. Because as soon as you're just doing something for the story like that, you do start to fetishize it a little bit. And this is why you have this kind of genre or group of people who love all these big kind of gangster type films is because it, it is steering into like the excessive violence for the sake of it without it like put in a marker up to say this is that because we are reflecting something that we're having a little bit of a, a wry look at rather than like oh yeah get some more guns out well it's like yeah i mean I, I, it depends on what you want yeah i was just going to come in on earlier when you were sort of saying film you know what's the purpose of film to have a sort of critique to it and i think it can do both to an extent it can critique but also sort of have this immersive experience i don't it can be both. Well, yeah, it like, should. No, it should, it be, should, both. Yeah, yeah, it exactly. should be both. But that's why I think when you start steering too much into this is an immersive epic, yeah, I don't think that's enough to make a fully rounded film. Because I think that's just then going, oh, look at this. Like, it's voyeurism then. I think, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an age-old sort of question, isn't it? In the sense of, like, you know, what purpose does violence serve? I mean, I've... Tarantino, I think, has been asked this repeatedly in interviews. Yeah. You know, sort of, oh, you know, why are you so violent? And he's just he's stopped answering those questions now. You know, the purpose that violence serves. I think the purpose that violence serves in Scarface is it's to emphasize the brutality, the sort of the emptiness and the, the horror of that world. Mm. Um, and I don't doubt for a second that that's what it was probably like. But I, there's just no. Um, I was going to say there's no redemption, but again, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, because it is meant to be. It's like, that, look that at all that, this. That is like, the oh, point. This is the American dream. You, I, you know what? I was literally just going to say that. Um, the con- yeah, the American dream. Abs- wavelength, wavelength. Absolutely. It's like the, the 80s, that was, you know, it was the reinvention of the American dream, wasn't it? You know, Reagan was all, you know, let's make America great again. And then Trump nicked that. But like, you know, it's just like, it's it's that, isn't it? It's like that 1980s go get it culture Mm -hmm. at the expense of everybody else. And this is meant to be Um, like saying, look, this is the ugly face of it. And again, I come back to that restaurant scene and that's where I, it wins for me in terms of the critical bit that it has in there is that restaurant scene. It's saying, look, this is the ugly, ugly face of what America wants to be, but it's covered up in this veneer of progress and modernity. For sure. I mean, the violence didn't really perturb me. Really, I well, you know, I I don't know. I, I'm not necessarily desensitized to it. That's the wrong word, but like, I didn't necessarily have the sort of um, the shock factor that I am that I imagine it would probably would have had in the 1980s. I don't know. Like for me, I just found it quite bloated. Mm-hmm. I think it could have been an hour, 45 minutes or an hour shorter mm-hmm. because really each scene doesn't exactly say anything that the previous one didn't. 
It is a yeah. lot more of the same. It's quite episodic. It? It's quite episodic, yeah. but in the sense that in the sense that every episode in the in the in the in the, in the film is exactly the same to a, to an extent. But that's what it seems to take um, to fall into this genre of the classic, like I was in the right. grand narrative and things like that. Because without that, does it have enough in terms of, as I say, well, criticality, I insight, I mean, whatever? Taxi Driver is considered a classic. Yep. Yeah. And you know. There's the the end scene of that is incredibly violent. Yes, but that does um, it cuts through a bit more that film, doesn't it? Because it does. there is no, it, something, it does. There is something and that's why I think Scarface lacks a bit. Is that bit more of a to hang your insightful on, view? Yeah. Let's yeah. wrap this up, Callum. I think we've Let's, gone yeah, through that yeah, nice. Yeah, and yeah. it's always good to look at a classic. It's good to go back it is, because it is. yeah, yeah. Yes, we want to keep our finger on the pulse, but remember where film came from. <laughs> so I always enjoy looking back on that. But yeah, just to summarise. As much as I enjoyed watching something from a, a different era, I don't think it did enough in terms of um, holding that mirror up to the era that it, it t- did through a token element, because I think there was definitely something in there. And as you said as well, there was some historic intrigue in there, but it did that, but then also almost backed away from it in favour of the violence and um, romanticising something in that era of the 80s of hyper-masculinity money and stuff like that in in the sense that it was meant to be criticized but i think for it to become the epic it has been built up as like that is the winner for it yeah god built the tension up nicely wasn't really for me and i don't think it was as captivating as i was led to believe but solid enough film six out of ten callum what are your thoughts yeah i mean i thought it was yeah it's 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 not a bad film in in the in that stretch of the in that, in that at all, I think the strongest element for me was the cinematography and Pacino's performance. Those are the two strongest for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I found it a little bit too episodic. I found it really sort of like just repetitive, quite bloated um, in lots of ways. Uh, I'm struggling between five or six out of ten. I wouldn't watch it again, and I think there's better movies to watch that achieve the same message but better i'm gonna push you for a number six it's gone six out of ten yeah. thank you very much callum well there we go there's another episode there we, there we, go. we went for a classic we dived in and i thoroughly enjoyed these little side sweeps of the podcast where we go back and have a look at a few more epics and once again callum thoroughly enjoyable to review in person absolutely share yeah. this experience over a coffee with you with a camera in the room you can watch some clips of this check us out and that slides us nicely in if you want a little bit more insight into the podcast our instagram page at the glacé film club let us know what you think of our reviews or the films that we've reviewed and maybe some suggestions of what you'd like us to chat about in the future we've also got the whole back catalog on the different streaming platforms loads of reviews and conversation episodes with different people from the world of tv film video and other creative areas but that was that Until next time, that was another episode of the Glass A Film Club podcast. We'll see you all later.